Starting off here, we have Mark Schleyball. First question for you. Hey, Dan, I know you guys don't care much about what outsiders say, but a lot of people were talking about your defense being historically good before the Alabama game. What have you got to do to kind of cement its reputation the second time around? I just play the brand of football we're able to play. You know, our guys take a tremendous amount of pride in the way we work and uh, the work we put into this season. But it doesn't take anything exceptional or extraordinary. Just do what we know how to do. Next will be Chip Towers. Chip. Hey, Coach. Um, you you uh, you dealt with this some uh, in at the Orange Bowl, but obviously the no sacks against Alabama last time. And a lot of the narrative was that Georgia didn't try to pressure the quarterback that much, but you know, I certainly don't look at it as uh, uh, educated as you do, but it looked like that you guys were really trying some stuff to get to him and just couldn't get to him. So obviously how important is it to get pressure on Bryce Young this time? And what about the, just the whole factor of, you know, it's just a month later. Do you do a lot of different things or do you try to do this? Same things better. Yeah, um, you know, ultimately we want to create pressure. We want to get after Bryce. As far as how we're going to do it, I don't want to give away all our secrets yet, Chip. I mean, hopefully we can wait until after the game to figure that out. But, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we want to generate pressure, and certainly there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, he's really good at, at avoiding the rush, and, and they did some unique things uh, to protect him. So we have to attack it a little bit differently. But, um, you know, how we do that, there, there's a lot of different ways we can do it. Next, we'll hear from Ralph Russo. Ralph? Good morning, Dan. Um, I'm interested when you've been in a fair amount of different places, small school guy, um, as far as football yourself. When you were at Alabama for a year and now at Georgia, um, it's going to sound silly. Like, how much do you notice how much better the players are? But when you see when you get to a place like Georgia and you've been other places, what is sort of that moment of like, Oh my, like, look like this looks different from some of the other places I've been. Obviously, you know, that going in, but when you actually see it and are part of it, do, do you, do, does it sort of hit you in a way that's a little different when you get there? Yeah. I mean, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. And I mean, ultimately I think one of the biggest things is different, especially in our league and playing against a team like, um, Alabama's in the trenches, you know, up front with the defensive line and offensive line, but the speed on the field, um, you know, it's all, it's all relative because every football field is a hundred yards. Right. But the, the size and the speed is, is a tremendous difference. Next will be Mark Weiser. Mark. Hey, Dan, uh, Nolan Smith was on here earlier. He kind of shared how emotional he got losing to Alabama in the SEC championship game. Is that the player you know that, that pours a lot into what he does? And, uh, you know, at the outside linebacker position, this is a little kind of second question. What, what do you leave him behind when you go to Oregon in terms of guys that are up and coming that, that you expect can uh, uh, take a next step? Yeah. I mean, um, uh, Nolan's an emotional guy, but, you know, it, it, that's one of his greatest strengths. He takes so much pride in what he does. He cares so much. Um, and I think that's one of the things that made us unique this year is how many guys on our on our defense and on our team that care. And, uh, you know, obviously you want you want people on your team that care. Um, yeah, I'm excited about what that room will look like going forward. Probably not for the first game next year, um, but they've got some good guys in there. You know, but, you know, Chaz Chambliss. Um, you know, Nolan, I think, has got a great opportunity to make a decision on what he wants to do going forward. You know, MJ Sherman, you know, and there obviously is there's some young talent that's getting brought in there as well. I know, you know, Rob Beal has a decision to make as well. Um, so some of these guys have uh, tough decisions to make. I, I know that's not their focus right now. And then we signed some, you know, young talent in that room also. So it'll be a good room. Next will be Mike Rodak. Mike? How do, how do you go about preparing for Alabama's wide receivers, the younger guys who don't have a lot of film on them, and just how did you adjust your defense when, when John Mechie was injured in that last game? Yeah, I mean, the, they have talent at wide out. Just, you know, e even losing um, Mechie, those other guys that have come in have shown that they're obviously really capable and, and uh, successful players, but it does change your plan. You'll have to do some things differently. I know we've brought a lot of speed over, um, you know, from the offense 
uh, at times we're able to use guys during certain periods to, to extend the field and push it down the field. And we're getting a really good look from our, from our look team um, because we're able to use those guys. So ultimately it doesn't change everything that you do when they have different people plugging in play, but there's an awareness on where certain guys line up and, and uh, what they do when they line up there. Right. Next, we'll hear from Zach Klein. Zach? You got Zach there? There we go. Just waiting to get unmuted. Thanks, Brett. Um, Dan, Nicobe Dean told me that you were the first ever coach to see him when he was in high school and you were in Memphis. He said that you told him you just want to put eyes on him, probably not going to get you here, but might get you down the road. Uh, what do you remember from that first meeting with Nicobe? Yeah, <laughs> Nicobe. Sorry, was there more to that question, Zach? Yeah. You know, ultimately, I was at Memphis at the time when when I first um, learned about Nicobe Dean. He had a great head coach, um, Brad Boyette, who, uh, you know, I was a big fan of and got to that was my area recruiting Mississippi when I was at Memphis. So got to go down there and see him. Um, and everybody talked about what kind of player he was. And that was evident on his film. He actually kind of played the star position outside backer spot as a freshman, um, played really early. Um, but what was impressive was all the things off the field for Nicobe, his academic standing, the leader he was in his community. Um, this guy did homework nonstop. When you talk to him in recruiting, he'd be, hey, coach, I appreciate it, but I got to get get off the phone. I got I to gotta get back to homework. So um, he's just his work ethic, and he's a great example of the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Uh, Nicobe really lives by that standard. It's the, the same way he gives off the field, the same way he um, is in the classroom, is, is the same way he is on the field. So I have a lot of fond memories of growing um, you know, of, of recruiting to Kobe and then now having him as a player and uh, was excited to get to Georgia where we had a chance to get him. All right, next we'll hear from Steve Croner. Steve? Yeah, Coach, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, going against Brock Bowers for another nine months anyway, but as a defensive coordinator, when a team has a tight end as good as Brock Bowers, what does that do to uh, your mindset and to your, your scheme heading into that game? Yeah, Brock's a headache for the other team. I'm glad he's on our team. Um, you know, it, in a lot of ways, Brock's like having another wideout out there on the field, obviously. And uh, he's extremely talented, does a great job catching the ball in tough situations. I think he's um, developed a great amount of trust, you know, with, with Stetson and um, in, in the offense. And he's really done, you know, Coach Munkin's done a phenomenal job of moving him around and, and using him in a lot of unique ways. So you have to, you definitely have to treat him different. You can't treat him like a, uh, your standard tight end. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Michael Casagrande. Michael, you're up. Yeah, Dan, uh, we hear a lot about Kirby Smart and his ultra competitive side. What do you, what memories do you have of him? Anything behind the scenes that you could tell us about what he's like as a competitor in practices or in games? I just, it, it doesn't matter what it is for, for Coach Smart. Um, you know, I love his passion, you know, and I, I've always said that I think your players take on the energy that you put out as a coach. Um, and Coach Smart has tremendous passion, whether it be team run on a Tuesday in practice or if it's Saturday out there on game day, uh, he brings it every single day. There's never been a day that I walked off the field and been like, well, Coach wasn't really out there to know. That's never happened. Um, and, you know, you see the same thing around his family, whether he's playing basketball with his son or um, whatever it is, the guy just likes to win. And that resonates through our program. Uh, and he prepares to win. It's not something where you just roll the ball out and think you're going to show up. Um, he's willing to do the work it takes uh, to be successful. So I think he realizes that, you know, when you compete, it's not just you compete on game day. You have to compete in the way you practice. You have to compete in the way you prepare, um, the way you analyze data and uh, results and I just you see that constantly um, from coach smart to something certainly that I've learned being here um, but he you know he wears it on his sleeve every day and I, I appreciate that next up is Maria Martin Maria hey 
Hey, Dan, going back to Nicobe Dean for a second, you know, we've seen him get recognized for what he's been able to do on the field this year. And, you know, it seems like every Saturday or Friday, for that matter, uh, that he's playing, he shows up. What have you seen in the evolution of him as a player throughout the season? Yeah, I think, um, you know, he's attacked a lot of the things that we thought he could he could get better at. You know, Coach Schumann does a phenomenal job with that linebacker room, not just Nicobe, but, you know, Channing. Uh, Quay Walker, the, these guys have played at a really high level all year. But, uh, you know, Nicobe's really improved in his coverage uh, ability. In my mind, he's really taken pride in being an, uh, an explosive blitzer. Uh, and he's created a lot of havoc plays with that, the way he's played, um, the physicality that he plays with. This guy tackles in practice. You know, he, he works really hard in, in practice to be a good tackler. And I think that's something he's improved in and you see. Um, but he's just a lot more efficient overall in his movements. Uh, and that comes with that comes with reps. The more you play, the more successful you're going to be. And, and I think you see that with him. Thank you. Next up, we'll hear from Dennis Dodd. Dennis. It's awkward silence. Yeah, sorry about that, coach. All good. You want me to keep rolling? Got Dennis Dodd coming up here. Hey, there you go. Unmute. Uh, Dan, is there is, is there a position group that traditionally shows more leadership than others? And who are the, some of the best leaders you've had in, in your career on that side of the ball? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. Dan. Uh, you know, ultimately, I don't. I don't think there's one. Um, you know, leaders, you know, the, a lot of times you can say you want to identify them as a coach, but the reality is the players identify the leaders on your team. It's, it's who they follow. It's, it's who they see do it. Um, you know, each week, each day. Um, I've been here before where we were, you know, um, you know, really led by guys in the back end like J.R. Reed and, and uh, you know, but it, it's been every position group that I've been around. I mean, we've had it last year. I think, you know, we had a little more leadership there, at, um, you know, at the corner position. Right now you'd say that we're really, um, you know, have leaders there on the defensive front with, with linebackers in the D-line. Um, but every year it's, it's a different group. And the reality is the players follow the guys – um, that lead and uh, been fortunate enough to be around a lot of really good ones. Um, this team has as good as, as any that I've ever been around. You know, I think Coach Smart mentioned it earlier, um, you know, this season, but it's the first time I've ever been a part of a team that we came off after a big win. Uh, and our players are in the locker room talking about, hey, what we have to do better, literally right after the game, call the entire team up. And I think that's unique. That's, uh, that's certainly special. Great. Thank you. All right, next we'll hear from Seth Emerson. Seth, you're up. Dan, not to relitigate the pass rush strategy against Alabama too much, but it, it seems like you all had a choice of do what maybe what some other teams had done against Alabama to success earlier or kind of stick with what had worked for you all the first 12 games. Is, is that too simplistic a way to sum it up, or, or is that close to what you saw it as? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think we watch film pretty close and try to see what's successful against the team. And I think they had good answers and played better than we played that day. Um, you know, I think we're always been really pretty, pretty multiple and, and have a variety of ways that we can attack teams. I think we've carried that into every game. So, um, if you go back and look at that game, we tried to attack in a lot of different ways and they were more successful than us. I think we'll always have, you gotta have answers and, um, they had better answers that day than we did, but um, we'll build off of that. Next up will be Mike Griffith. Mike, you're up. Ready for Mike Griffith now. There we go. Yeah, we're, we're the pause is because we wait. We have to unmute. We have to wait for them to prompt us, coach. Um, good. I want to ask about uh, Trayvon Walker and just – the, the defensive end position, it, it doesn't seem to lend itself to the same sort of sack numbers. And I know everybody kind of plays their spot, but could you share the importance and the responsibility of that end position in Georgia's scheme? And then if you can elaborate just on Trayvon and, and what's made him so special. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I, I think one of the things that makes our, our defense special is they're willing to accept whatever role it is for that game for us to be successful. And, you know, Trayvon's a great example of that. Um, that being said, what makes Trayvon special is his athleticism. I mean, he's, he's got special talent. He's very unique. I think we've, we've all mentioned several times that he was a high school basketball player and really successful. But his ability to move, 
Um, I think you, you see in that last Michigan game, he's he's starting to play with another brand of physicality as well. And that's starting to show up. And that ultimately, to me, was one of the pieces of his game that he can improve on. And he's done a great job of that, embracing that challenge of being you know, physical at the point of attack. But he's got speed. He's got the ability to drop in, in coverage. He's got the ability to rush. Uh, the passer, and I think the production comes with that over time. But I'll say this, most teams know where he's at, and there's probably something to be said for that as well. All right, thank you. Next we'll hear from Connor Riley. Connor Riley will be next. Hey, Dan, with this being your last game at Georgia, what are you going to miss about coaching at this place, and specifically with this defensive group, what are you going to miss about coaching them? I mean, ultimately, for me, coaching is about relationships. And I, I love these players like I love my, my family. Um, they've just been so good to me. I, I wouldn't be uh, near the coach I've been or the, had the success I've had in this profession if it wasn't for these players. Um, so I'll miss that a lot. I'm going to miss uh, the coaching staff. You know, there's a great bond on our staff. I really enjoy the guys I get to work with every day. And um, I don't feel like I go to work. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm going to do something I love each day, which is um, uh, a pleasure. But to me, the people. You know, ultimately, I'll I'll uh, I'll miss the people. I'm certainly excited about new new adventures, and really excited about the group of of men and and caliber of men that we have on our staff and the players. I mean, these players are are great kids and uh, super talented. So excited about that situation, but you'll always miss the people you work with and and the people that helped you get where you're at now. All right. <clears throat> Next up will be Ralph Russo. Ralph, you're up. Hey, uh, thanks for letting me ask a follow-up, Brett. Uh, Dan, uh, I, I know you can't move the Atlanta metro area to Eugene, so that. But what can you bring with you from your time at Georgia? Uh, philosophy, strategy, maybe apparatus that you can rebuild at your Oregon uh, as far as recruiting, as far as recruiting is concerned. Yeah, well, one of the big benefits, obviously, of being at Oregon is it is a national brand. We can go anywhere in the nation and, and be able to sign players. Um, but I think you can just bring, you know, bring that relentless pursuit that we operate with day in and day out here um, and, and the organization behind it. Um, we can bring the mentality of how we play football to a certain level. Uh, and I've been really fortunate to have high quality experience uh, in my time, whether it be here at Georgia or uh, Memphis or Alabama or some of the other places I've been able to visit. So. Um, and coach. So taking all that out there, I think will be really important. Um, and then the biggest thing is just learning from that experience. Not a, not any situation is the exact same, um, but, re, you know, recruiting ultimately at the end of the day comes down to work. And that's it's going to take gr uh, work to get great players um, at Oregon. And, and we have the ability to get great players there and great players should want to come there. All right. <clears throat> and our final question for today will come from Lane Higgins. Lane. Hey there, coach. Um, it seems like in the past few years, you know, few people have been able to solve Alabama and, you know, LSU and Clemson have had their chances to get one over Alabama, but does it feel like there's almost this accumulated pressure on Georgia, given how many swings this team has had against Alabama in consequential games and also just the added pressure that it's happening again in a national championship. And, you know, there's that whole 41 years thing hanging over your head too. Yeah, none of that's hanging over our head, Lane. At the end of the day, we, I mean, we want to go perform to the best of our ability. Um, we want to we want to execute at a really, really high level. Um, it's, but ultimately, it's not about them. It's about us. We want to go play our best game. And if we play our best game, we feel confident that, um, you know, that we can win that game. Um, that being said, they're a really good team, and they deserve all the credit in the world for everything they've done uh, over time. Um, but so are we. So we expect a good game. We expect a tough challenge. Um, but there's – there's no more pressure outside the room than the pressure that we put on ourselves to perform at a high level. I know that. And I know how much our players care, how much our coaches care. So we got to have a great plan and we got to go out there and execute. And I think we can do that. Coach, thank you very much for your time. We look Appreciate forward to seeing you in Indianapolis this weekend.